Hi, everyone. I am Overthink Podcast co-host, Dr. David Peña Guzman. And I'm Dr. Ellie Anderson. We're both philosophy professors, <laughs> and you can find our podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen. We also host the YouTube channel, Overthink. And uh, we are here today uh, to chat about a book written by the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Um, this is a book that I inherited recently from a colleague um, who That's gave... a beautiful, like, old It's an edition. old, it's a very old edition. Yeah, I wonder if it's even, like, um, when was this one published? I don't know. Oh, by the way, we didn't mention. Um, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com, Overthink Podcast. Also a way to connect. Yes. Um, and uh, this book was written by Kierkegaard um, in... Uh, in an attempt to make sense of the problems that he saw with the 19th century. And so when I inherited this book, I decided to read it. And I told Ellie that I was really enjoying this book by Kierkegaard, where he's just ranting and ranting and ranting about everything that is wrong with the 19th century. Because you said um, it has a lot of similarities to the present day, right? Yeah. And so and so we decided to do this uh, short book discussion yeah. about the present age, the Kierkegaard book, in relation to the present age, i.e. our time. Yes, although I should say, because you keep talking about the book, I'm, I read the short, I read a short excerpt from it from the Kierkegaard Reader, which if you've seen my lectures on Kierkegaard, you've seen me use. This is a really good introduction to some of his ideas. Um, and for the purposes of time, I read the excerpt that's provided here. Okay. So cutting, you'll have... Cutting corners, I see. No, we, we <laughs> agree kidding. on this. Don't put me on blast. Um, but you have, yeah, like a fuller knowledge of what's going on here, so... Yeah, and so this text was written in the 1840s, and I, I thought to begin with a little bit of background because I think it's um, kind of fun. Okay. Just for <laughs> situating the, re the the rhetorical moves. Well, that perfect, because it's going to allow me to find my page because I'm having a really hard time finding where this is in the long read. It was stuff. in the other book. Okay, go for it. Um, it so uh, Kierkegaard wrote it in 1846, and uh, a lot of the content is a criticism of what he calls the age of understanding. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, he thinks essentially that his contemporaries and his culture more broadly are just too cerebral and that there is something fundamentally wrong with that. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with the rise of um, the public and especially newspapers and mass media. Um, it, and the background that I wanted to share is that at the time, Kierkegaard was particularly upset uh, with the media because some Danish newspaper had published a couple of cartoons making fun of him mm -hmm. as a Danish mm -hmm. philosopher. And okay. so they represented him in cartoonish ways. Yeah. Um, and, and so a lot of the vitriol that comes out in this text, I think, is kind of traceable okay. to the fact that he just had an axe to grind with this particular yeah. Danish newspaper, but he does make some um, really interesting comments about the nature of publicity, about the relationship between inner thought and public audiences. Yeah, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll get into. Yeah, which uh, will help us think about our present age. Yeah, so I wanted to, uh, to say a quick thing too about like mm -hmm. him as a writer here because Kierkegaard most often writes in pseudonyms, but this is a text that is written in his own name. So that's, I think, worth noting as well, yeah. is that he's literally writing this in his own name um, and not under a pseudonym, whereas like most of his works are written in that way. Yeah, and uh, later in his life, so he has this critique, we'll talk about it, of the public. And later in his life, also in connection to this book, he, he comes to the realization that he has to address a possible objection to all his critiques of the public yeah which is that he himself is a writer yeah. <laughs> not all that different from like people writing in newspapers um so there's a, a book that he publishes later on on the nature of authorship um also written under um under his name where he reflects on this so here mm -hmm. he's somewhat uncritical about yeah. his own position as a writer relative to these other means for the dissemination of writing. Mm -hmm. But still, we'll leave that for another time. Yeah, he's kind of a perfect example of the multiplicity of the self at a particular moment and definitely over time, <laughs> over time. even when you're writing in your same in your name in both cases. Yeah, like honestly, as a writer, really, really fascinating. Um, his his style, his rhetoric, uh, his use of irony. Sometimes mm -hmm. he's so difficult to pin down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's a kind of writer that I, I really enjoy reading, even though in the grand scheme of things, I'm not that interested in the philosophy of religion. Yeah, but, yeah. but Kierkegaard just like makes me want to read it. Yeah, because even though he's a Christian philosopher, I think you can get a lot out of him regardless of what your your religious views are. Yeah. Um, where do you want to start? 
So let's start um, a little bit by talking about um, essentially the main target of, of, the, of Kierkegaard's analysis, which is what he calls the function of leveling mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. that he sees as happening pretty totally. much all around him. Yeah, this is, uh, it is so relevant to the present. <laughs> yes, it is. It's really, it's really good. So Kierkegaard talks about how his contemporaries are creatures of the understanding. Um, and, you know, when you, whenever you hear understanding in a philosophical context from a major European philosopher, um, in the background here is a critique of Kant um, and, of a and of a Kantian approach to life with a focus on reason. So in short, he thinks that a lot of his contemporaries are too focused on, on rational concepts uh, and mastering abstract concepts and also on trying to make those abstract concepts um, sort of legible to um, to a broader audience in a way that that poisons genuine thinking. Yeah, uh, and this is what he calls leveling down. Yeah, I mean, there's there's like an emphasis on the lowest common denominator of understanding, and yeah. so when you are emphasizing the lowest common denominator, you are losing a lot. You're losing a lot of nuance. But I think even more importantly for Kierkegaard, you're losing a sense of inwardness, of, of actual connection. And so I've been thinking about this a little bit in terms of a distinction that came up in a book I was doing um, for research for one of our episodes on information versus meaning. Okay. And this idea that we live in an age of information where we just want these accessible packets of knowledge, right, that we can transmit among people with no... Uh, no you know, barriers to communication. Um, if you think about it literally in terms of computers, it's like making everything into a number, yeah, a zero or a one. <laughs> and that that is really not the way that meaning is best conveyed. You have to have a personal relationship with, say, a text uh, or an idea or, you know, a person, whatever it might be, mm. in order to actually... I would say understand, but you said that's the word he's oh. not using here. But in order to connect with it, yeah. right? Or to and, comprehend or internalize, I don't know. Yeah, and I, I want to just kind of put that into dialogue. I'm curious what you think about this in terms of our own roles as as public what? philosophers who have a podcast and a YouTube channel. Because I think one thing that like I get praise on in my YouTube lectures is their clarity and their accessibility. Mm-hmm. Which, okay, cool, great. I'm so happy that people are connecting with them and finding the way that I'm conveying these complex ideas accessible. At the same time, I think, and you know, you have, I, you know, I've talked about this in other contexts, I think in at least like one or two YouTube videos. We do interact outside of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I was actually talking about like on YouTube too. We've definitely uh, oh, talked yeah, about yeah, it yeah. in real life many times. But the way that there's also... I, I do, we also don't want to give off the impression that we think that that's what philosophy is. Like, oh, let's make Kierkegaard digestible. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. here's like the sound bite for Kierkegaard. That that memification of philosophy, I think, is so mm -hmm. dangerous. And it's totally what Kierkegaard is talking about as leveling. And so he says yeah. that what happens with leveling is leveling comes about in a reflective, apathetic age. And here's a quote from him. Leveling is a quiet, mathematical, abstract enterprise that avoids all agitation. There's a sense of like, give me in the clearest and most succinct possible terms what this exactly means. Yeah. Like I did a TikTok recently and somebody accused me of word salad, probably because they're not into philosophy. And it's just like, mm. oh, great. Somebody accusing a philosopher of word salad. Never heard <laughs> that one before. Some philosophy, sure, is word salad. Yes. But I also think that that charge is so often a charge of this is too complicated for me to understand. Make it easier for me. Cut up all my broccoli and meat for me and just deliver it in this like little tidy package of information. Yeah. So there is the focus on um, sort of digestibility, um, which would be kind of like an empty formalism for Kierkegaard. It's yeah. just like you have the form, but there is no real content. There. Yeah, yeah. There's no substance. Yeah. Um, and, and then he has also the image of the the people who, who demand this empty formalism as essentially like people who will let out the, the attack dogs the moment that they're not satisfied. There's a whole dis discussion here of the public mm. as this anonymous, formless, amorphous, chaotic crowd. Totally. 
that is quite ravenous yeah. um, because they demand satisfaction and they demand that anybody who is not satisfying their needs and their demands be sacrificed mm -hmm. as the price to pay for not bowing down to them. Yeah. And he has this whole image of the crowd has this dog, this angry, violent dog, and they will unleash the dog to go and attack any real writer mm -hmm. or any real thinker that dares be original, that dares be an individual that doesn't fit the mold or that is critical of the crowd. And then when the when the claim comes out that the dog has killed uh, a writer or an author, because it's an amorphous crowd composed of just like figures, but no, no real individuals, nobody takes responsibility. Yeah. And so I read this very much in connection to like contemporary discussions about like um, virality uh, going viral or like these kind of like crowd events that happen in social media um, and where, you know, the mob comes after particular people yeah. demanding its pound of flesh. Ah, uh, okay. Well, this is interesting because in our podcast episode a while back mm -hmm. that we did on cancellation, um, the so-called cancel culture, culture, you were really pro-canceling. And I, I, I wonder mm -hmm. whether, like, this type of argument could be used to say, like, this is the problem with so-called cancel culture, uh, so, yeah, again, as I said in that episode, I prefer to talk about deplatforming and the benefits yeah, yeah. of deplatforming. Yeah. Um, you so not like, yay, cancel. Yeah, yeah. So, like, um, I, I do believe deplatforming is an important tool for political activism in the present. Um, and and uh, it doesn't mean that there there isn't a risk of um, crowd and uh, uh, mob formation. Uh, but what I'm thinking here about more... Um, if, is even think about something like um, on Facebook when you post something and it leads to a debate and mm -hmm. people, it just like starts becoming more and more disorganized and it's hard to give shape to the discourse yeah. and it just loses all boundaries and parameters. Okay. Um, and I think that's what he's talking about, that, yeah. that that's already happening in the 19th century um, when, and, and it's incentivizing writers and thinkers to adapt themselves to the desires okay. of this amorphous crowd. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I could see connections definitely to cancel culture. Yeah, well, and I mean, with respect to your point about the lack of individuality that we see in leveling, I was struck by that here because, yeah, he says no particular individual can take the lead in leveling because if a particular individual took the lead, then they would be escaping the leveling and they wouldn't be leading the leveling, right? Because they would be outside of the leveling. So he says that particular individuals may contribute to leveling, but leveling is an abstract power and is abstraction's yes. victory over individuals. And what strikes me as kind of insidious there is that individuals are actually powerless in the face of leveling, even though leveling comes about through communal... I don't know if we want to say action or <laughs> forms of understanding, right? Because he says no particular individual can halt the abstraction of, of leveling for it is a negatively superior force. And the reason yeah. for this, in his view, is that we no longer live in an age of heroes. I'm not quite sure what to make of that idea because the age of heroes, I mean, we did a heroes podcast episode as well. Um, in which I, I kind of came around to the idea of the hero more than I thought I would. <laughs> but still, Age of Heroes to me speaks of a... It sounds a little bit nostalgic. I don't know. In, in a yeah. way that I'm not sure I would necessarily want to go with. Yeah. So I think there are two separate ways in which the figure of the hero plays out in this text. One is through the very notion of individuality, right? The hero, by definition, is an individual yeah, yeah, who exactly. asserts yeah. and uh, and and uh, differentiates himself or herself from the crowd uh, precisely through uh, their their uniqueness. The second link here, and this is quite important for understanding his critique of what he calls the reflective age, yeah. is the link to action. Because um, it, and here the target of this analysis, I'm pretty sure, is actually Hegel. Your um, one of your favorite thinkers. Um, and, 
because he says we live in a world where everybody just reflects and reflects not one and of reflects. Kierkegaard's favorite thinkers, by the yeah, way. Oh yeah, no, he, he yeah. despised. I think uh, one Hegel. can love both Hegel and Kierkegaard, yeah. but Kierkegaard did not love Hegel, and Hegel probably would not have loved Kierkegaard if he had lived long enough to see. Yeah, him. probably not. Yeah. Anyway, um, sorry, I no, interrupted you there. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> On um, the reflection. Yeah, and so he says we live in this era where we value reflection, but only abstractly. And what he means by that is that we value reflection where individuals, you know, assuming that they get to the point of, of being reflective, they just play with concepts and go back and forth, sometimes even dialectically. So this is where the reference to Hegel is. So you can be a perfectly good Hegelian thinker where you just have thoughts and you look at the neg at the negation and the negation and so on and so forth yeah. and see the progress of knowledge. But the problem for Kierkegaard is that nobody ever translates that dialectic of thought into a dialectic of thought to action mm -hmm. so nobody acts in the world he has this whole rant in the text okay. about how we live in a world without heroes because we live in a world without action. action and everybody and this is connected to the crowd everybody just takes satisfaction in in the fact that they don't act either because they already knew that that was the right action and they didn't, they didn't have to do it or they knew that it wasn't going to work out anyways. So everybody finds rationalizations in wow. thought for their inactivity. Oh my God. Too real. It's yes. too real. <laughs> well, this is also his reading of Hegel in other texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that, no, but I mean, it's too real yeah. for like the present. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The present age to go back to the, the what you know, the title of the Yeah. Text. So he thinks we're wishy-washy, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again. Again. Too real. This like, uh, collective action problem of well, or tragedy of the commons type of thing. And he. Well, can I throw two examples and? Yeah. yeah. Let me you, see what you, you think about it. You read the whole book. It. I only read an excerpt. <laughs> so I, I really liked it. But he, after he lays out this whole critique of the public and of um, we live in a reflective age without action, he gives concrete examples of what he means of how you see this in people's behavior, and one of them, for example, is talkativeness. He says people like become um, rambling um, gossips or uh, chatter they become boxes. chatter boxes precisely because they have nothing substantive to say. Mm. And so they start just talking about other people. And so this would be an example of what he means of form without content. Yeah, you're obviously speaking and saying words, but nothing means anything and nothing has weight. The other example that he gives, and I, I because I know you work in uh, philosophy of love and sex, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. He uses the example of flirting. He thinks flirting is the romantic and sexual version of empty chatter. Because he says, when you flirt, it's as if you're going through the motions of seeking romance. Okay. But you're all over the place and you don't actually commit. Hmm. And it means that you can never really find love. Um, it, obviously, it's like kind of weirdly conservative in, in terms of sex and romance, well, but it, okay, know. yeah. So both of those are really interesting. the The first thing that you mentioned, this chatterbox style uh, form of communication, is I think developed further in Heidegger's work as this notion of idle talk. And now I'm wondering, yes. I don't know about this historically, I'm sure someone who does, like whether this is one of the many things that Heidegger kind of cribbed from Kierkegaard. I had the same thought. Yeah, That's yeah. Because um, Kierkegaard, or Heidegger sometimes cites Kierkegaard when he's pulling from Kierkegaard, but a lot of times he doesn't. And I wonder about this because in Being in Time, there's that whole section on idle talk, which by the way, I've been revisiting. Maybe we should talk about this at some point, but I've been revisiting that section from being in time because it's often vilified. Um, so Heidegger has a critique there of the way that our everyday modes of discourse are just trapped in this kind of vague abstraction. They're not really saying anything substantial. Um, it's an inauthentic form of communication. But Heidegger also says inauthenticity isn't a, quote, bad thing. And so I think it's really important to always keep that in mind when we're talking about inauthentic versus authentic in Heidegger. He's not condemning the inauthentic. So this might actually be a distinction between Kierkegaard and Heidegger, depending on how how strongly Kierkegaard is vilifying this. Because mm -hmm. I think what's happening for Heidegger is that it's sort of just the nature of our everyday communication that a lot of it is chatter. Yes. And like that's the social background out of which our deeper conversations emerge, right? 
So that's one thought. I want to talk about the love and sex thing too, but I don't know. It sounds like you maybe had a thought on well, that directly. Yeah, with this issue of talkativeness, for Kierkegaard, we direct our discourse outward to others and to events and things happening around us when we don't have the wherewithal to direct our discourse inward and really develop a, a kind of, let's say, a kind of inner depth okay. about which we could talk. Um, uh, we, I, we like go on Twitter or on TikTok yes, yes. when we're, oh my God. And so, and you know, Heidegger's um, claim that in order for you, you can only know that somebody has something to say when they, when they're silent. Yeah, or, this was like, something we talked yes. about in the silence episode. Listen to just this line. Cause I was like, okay. I was like, mm, there seems to be a connection here. Okay. What is talkativeness? It is the result of doing away with the vital distinction between talking and keeping silent. Only someone who knows how to remain essentially silent can really talk. Okay. We need some of our Heidegger <laughs> scholar friends, of which we have like a, a, a lot <laughs> yes. to verify for us uh, whether this is indeed something Heidegger is cribbing from Kierkegaard. Wow, yeah. that's fascinating. Okay. What about flirting? Flirting. Yeah, so flirting point. Let's like quickly to the fun, juicy side. I know. <laughs> okay. I think if we're talking about flirting, and I don't know what the word is in Danish, so I might be lacking a little bit of context here, but let's just, you know, kind of apply it to the present day in a, in a somewhat uh, straightforward, perhaps oversimplifying fashion. I don't think that flirting is a way of being cagey about romantic pursuits. Um, not to pull an ad hominem on Kierkegaard right now, but we know that the dude was not exactly successful in his romantic pursuits and took shit way too seriously. But um, I think flirting, first off, it often can be part of the romantic kind of standard development of a relationship. Oftentimes people flirt with one another in order to gauge one another's interest in order to then pursue, you know, some sort of liaison. So I think flirting has a teleological orientation for a lot of people. Whereas it sounded like what you were saying is that Kierkegaard's point is that flirting pretends to have the teleology of romance without actually having it. Teleology being yeah. goal orientedness or, you know, having a ending. Um, yeah. Like a, yeah. the logic of a certain end. Yeah. And so I wonder whether he's talking about flirt, like flirtation with one person or maybe what he means more is, you know, when we talk about a person as being a flirt, yeah, somebody who okay. like brings that kind of flirtation is to a lot of social dynamics because yeah. he says, um, and you'll now see the um, similar structure in the paragraphs. Okay, he says, cool. Yeah. The flirting, I didn't read the flirting yeah, like, bit. So what is flirtation? Kind of like what is talkativeness? What is flirtation? It is the result of doing away with the vital distinction between real love and real debauchery. Neither the real lover nor the real debauchee are guilty of flirting. So he's like, if you're going to flirt a bunch, either become like debaucherous and just go for it. Okay. Or stick to love. But again, it's this kind of wishy-washy space in the middle for him. Interesting. That doesn't commit to either way of life. Okay, yeah. So I, I definitely would not want to hold to a division <laughs> between love and debauchery. debauchery. I, I think that's very puritanical in form. Yeah. But I wonder whether we could more broadly apply this analysis to something like the gamification of dating you see today, and especially yeah. the F-boy phenomenon, which is something yes. that I've thought a lot about and yes. written about. Because I do think there is... A contemporary, and I'm not saying anything extraordinarily original here, but there is a contemporary fear of commitment, often especially among young men, that I think tends to evince an inability to actually connect on a certain level. And I don't, what I want to clarify there is that I'm not saying something as simple as uh, men just don't want to commit and like put a ring on it because that's <laughs> not my view of what love should be. But it's more a sense of overwhelming ambivalence, inability to actually forge a connection rather than like yes. an inability to commit marriage. in like the traditional yes. monogamous yeah. marriage. No, to form a genuine nuclear family bond, sense. Yeah. Uh, which is what matters. But so the point about Kierkegaard, the reason that he's talking about all these separate things like flirting, superficiality, authors is because he sees these all all of these phenomena as expressing the fundamental sickness of the present age in the 19th okay. in the middle of the 19th century 
which again is formlessness. Yeah. Is an unwillingness to really take a stance. Totally. To act um, and to come to the defense of that course of action. Yeah. Um, and that's what, for example, the fuck boy <laughs> would have yeah. in common um, with the chatterbot. Yeah. Or chatterbot. Chatterbot? Chatter- <laughs> well, nowadays too, the chatterbot, uh, chat GPT. <laughs> Um, it's this focus on going through motions um, without really having a substantive personality that has a clear orientation to a conception of the good life that they're willing to fight for. Yeah. Okay. So I actually, we should probably wrap up yeah. pretty soon, but um, there were, that that reminds me of the characterlessness point, but then I'd actually really want to, I want to hear your thoughts on envy, but let me mention a quick characterlessness thing, which actually, no, wait, they, they're related. So can we talk about envy? Uh, yeah, I honestly forget where this is. So uh, you I mean, go for it. it, it it's in my short excerpt, so I can't <laughs> tell you what page it's in in your full book version. Um, but I do, I do want to read the full book version. It was okay. just like you know, with the. It's very short. It's like seventy pages. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. With the demands of all the things we have going on, it made sense for me to read the short version here. Uh, so he says that enthusiasm was the unifying principle of the passionate age, or is in a passionate age, enthusiasm is a unifying principle. In a passionless and reflective age, our present age or his present age, envy is the unifying principle. And he says he's not interpreting this as like an ethical accusation. It's more just like a point about what our culture values. Um, And he says there are two sides to it. A selfishness in the individual and a self and a selfishness of other people towards us. Reflection's envy holds the will and energy in a kind of captivity, he says. So reflection keeps us imprisoned and it sort of obsesses us with selfishness and also with the idea that others are behaving selfishly towards us. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of similar to what Nietzsche describes as ressentiment, this sort of reactive emotion that is directed towards others that's vilifying others and rather than just like the the pure selfishness of the noble let's say and one thing that i found particularly interesting on this point is that he says envy turns into the principle of characterlessness slyly sneaking up out of disrepute to make something of itself but constantly covering up by conceding that it is nothing at all Characterless envy does not understand that excellence is excellence, does not understand that it is itself a negative acknowledgement of excellence, but wants to degrade it, minimize it until it actually is no longer excellence. And envy takes as its object not only the excellence which is, but that which is to come. So I'm going to I'm going to go out on quite a speculative limb here because okay. I think there are, are different ways of interpreting this view of envy. But here's what it's bringing up for me. It's bringing up for me this idea that people are constantly resentful of one another, not only for their achievements, but also for the possibility that they will actually achieve their dreams that they haven't yet achieved, right? Like, oh, well, that person has big plans. Ha ha. Good luck to them. Where you're kind of almost hoping hoping that they don't achieve yeah. their plans um, because you're constantly competing with one another, right? There's this, this competitiveness and there's a suspicion of character. There's a suspicion of excellence or integrity it's it's just like some kind of bs because we take for granted that everyone is selfish and so that they don't actually have any character yeah and i think it, the the thing that stood out from to me from what you read is the idea that the envious man or woman it's not just that they have an object of desire that they see somebody else have and they want it for themselves and yeah. they want to take it away from them is that they actually want to level down the object itself. They want yes. to demean yes. the, the object. So it's not just that I'll, I'll be like, oh, I'm really envious of Ellie's latest article. It's just that I'm going to shit on articles and scholarship. And I'm going to say that oh, it's, it's, not, it's, not it's that suspicious. You would, it's, it's not that you would shit on me. I, it's both. I think I would yeah. shit on you for, for that. But I would also go after the thing itself that you're that, that you're striving for and i will drag yeah, that yeah, down yeah. to the mud yeah um, and, you see both on in twitter pylons yeah yeah and so i think that's a a really pernicious form of envy because once you drag that ideal or that object of desire down it means that you effectively cut down the possibility of you yourself yeah. developing a positive 
aspiration or exactly. relationship to those things. Well, exactly. And I feel like that's something just, you know, on a personal note that I have felt like I've needed to overcome is this cultural tendency. Characterlessness. To... Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, sure. But specifically this idea that like, well, it's it's ridiculous to imagine that you could fulfill your dreams. And so don't even try because mm, anytime yeah. like we see other people trying to fulfill their dreams without having achieved them yet, it's easy to make fun of them. And I've like really, really had to resist that in my own life and just been like, hey, I'm going to go for it and see what happens because life is too short to let this weigh me down. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I mean, if if we are right to sort of just like wholesale place Kierkegaard's present age, which was almost 200 years ago, onto our present age, I don't know if we're right to do that. Then my question would be, maybe we could we could end on this, especially because mm -hmm. you read the whole book. Like, where where do where do you think we go from here? Is there? I mean, if if it's true that none of us have as individuals the power to escape leveling, he also doesn't think nations have the power to escape leveling. So it doesn't even seem to be like something we could achieve through collective action and solidarity. What happens? I mean, I think this is where religion comes in for me. <laughs> for, for him. For him. Okay. Um, okay. Because, the, I mean, literally, uh, if we're trying to be here using um, some some visual imagery, yeah. um, what religion does is... Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh so hard at that. It's just that you said earlier that, like, you know, we kind of stop with Kierkegaard at some of the religious moments. And yeah, yes. anyway, sorry. Right, but I, I think for him, it does have to do with religion in the sense that, I mean, by definition, what religion does is it elevates rather than leveling down. It levels yeah. up. Yeah. It levels the individual up to this to not to the status of God, but to our relationship with God. So it okay. introduces a vertical mm. uh, vector. Yeah, I, w I would say not even relationship with, though, because I feel like part of Kierkegaard's view of faith is actually that it that it is sort of unidirectional in a sense. It's not about a relation between two beings because you can't actually know God as a being separate from you. Sure. So yeah. you... this is a complicated, yes. complicated yeah. thoughts on Kierkegaard and religion. I do have a video of Kierkegaard on faith. I mean, obviously, okay. also super short, but uh, yeah. Yeah. And what happens for Kierkegaard when we enter into that? relationship um with the divine let's just say where we yeah. find ourselves um orientation towards, orientation perhaps? toward yes that's more unit unidirectional uh when we when we face god yeah um i think that's maybe language sure. that he uses um there are a couple of things that happen the first one is that the rest of the social world falls away so all the publicity all the um chit chat all the flirting all of the kind of layers of the onion that are insignificant and that are tied to leveling down fall away. Secondly, we um, intensify our individuality because when we face God, it's just us. So there's an element of solitude in yeah. the kind of relationship he wants to envision okay. as the essence of true Christianity. And the final one is that that relationship is also silent. Okay. Um, yeah, And yeah. so if we imagine, it's just kind of like you floating, you know, like looking at the divine and you become an individual. That's why he says religion individuates you. Mm -hmm. And that's what we don't have in the present age, true individuals. Okay. Might be solace for folks who are religious. For those who aren't, I think this is an invitation to think about what that might mean in a secular context. I always tell my students, like there's different interpretations of whether you can take a secular approach to Kierkegaard as well. And whether you're yeah. interpreting faith and religion in a secular fashion versus just like, you know, ignoring them in his thought. Um, yeah. But that's, that's great. Yeah. But I think, I think yeah. a secular version potentially would be the notion of commitment. Hmm. Uh, really... like a more existential, like an atheistic existential commitment. Um, yeah. But maybe with a little bit more solidity over time um, as sort of, thinking about what I want, the kind of person that I want to be and committing to a project um, and, and uh, really developing that project with all of my choices. And, and, and the difference here is that I think with Kierkegaard, there is a, I, I'm not sure what the language is, is there's a, instead of the absolute freedom of the existentialist, there is that kind of yoking myself to something and committing to it. There's a, an element of servitude uh, that comes from his religious upbringing, and he had a very strict religious upbringing. But if we could imagine a secular version of that, well, and I will say, I think that yoking is actually more. I think that's closer to to twentieth century existentialist than you might. But okay, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll check out the text if you haven't already, and um, yeah, we hope you'll keep 
pursuing your philosophical <laughs> interests, check us out on Apple, Spotify, Patreon, here on YouTube, etc. <laughs> if you haven't already. You, we will hope that you will yoke yourself to us in the future. Oh my God, that sounds so <laughs> grossly promotional. We didn't mean to end on like a promotional note. I just didn't know how to end. No, so. just to us. Uh, just like to the intellectual.